Right now, there are tiny habits you do every single day that could be silently destroying your gut health. And over the years, I've made all of these mistakes myself and was completely unaware of how they were messing up my gut. But thanks to some simple changes, I feel better with more energy and less brain fog at 35 than when I was 25. And you can do the same. For these seven habits, I'm gonna give you practical tips you can implement immediately to stop wrecking your gut health. Because if you're doing even one of these, and you probably are, getting it fixed will be a game changer for your health. As every high school student knows, ecosystems are made up of many different organisms all playing their part to keep the system in order. A change to one part of the system affects everything else. Your gut works in exactly the same way. There are trillions of bacterial and other microbes living in a delicate harmony in your gut. Occasionally, that balance gets off kilter, allowing harmful bacteria to thrive at the expense of others. In this situation, the first daily habit wrecking your gut health is actually your best friend. It's no exaggeration to say that antibiotics have saved hundreds of millions of lives. However, they're not the best at distinguishing between harmful bacteria and good bacteria. So a certain amount of disruption to the gut microbiome is inevitable when you take them. Of course, it is better to kill off harmful bacteria than not for fear of upsetting your gut microbiome balance. But please take antibiotics only if your doctor prescribes them. Popping antibiotics you don't need will damage your gut quicker than gas station soup in a heat wave. On the other hand, you'll often feel better before they've fully done their job, so do take them as long as your doctor says. And if you are prescribed antibiotics, don't be afraid to ask your doctor how you can minimize the harm to your gut microbiome. They might suggest changes to your diet or a medical grade probiotic. Just be careful of commercial probiotics, as many of them aren't worth the paper their labels are written on. I'll tell you how to identify the best probiotic supplement in just a minute. But while we only take antibiotics occasionally, the second everyday habit wrecking your gut health is something some of us experience every day. The whole purpose of your gut is to take the nutrients you need from the food you eat and get rid of everything else. That everything else can include some pretty nasty toxins, which is essential do not leave your gut as they'll create havoc somewhere else in your body. To stop that happening, the cells in the lining of your gut are sealed tight by proteins called tight junctions. You can think of them as the mortar between the bricks of our cells. But if that mortar disappears, you can increase the risk of a condition known as intestinal hyperpermeability. Just like the secrets in a dysfunctional family reunion, nasty things can slip through the cracks. And this is why the second everyday habit wrecking your gut health is so dangerous. Whether it's traffic in the morning, dealing with toxic colleagues or serious illness, shit happens. And not just straight after breakfast. Our body's response to stress is the hormone cortisol. Cortisol is our natural alarm clock getting us ready for the day. However, over time, elevated levels of cortisol can reduce the production of tight junctions, resulting in intestinal hyperpermeability. Now, to stop this from happening, all you might need to do is breathe. Here's Dr. Andrew Huberman talking about the vagus nerve, the information superhighway connecting the brain and the gut. Indeed, the vagus can slow heart rate, you know, down through a number of things like long exhale breathing. Earlier, we were talking about stress modulation, something my labs worked on. Extend your exhales. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the most basic way. Um, physiological size, two inhales followed by a full exhale to lungs empty. Um, these are core physiological mechanisms known to activate the vagus and lead to calming. Two inhales followed by an extended exhale reduces stress and directly benefits the gut via the vagus nerve. Beyond that, physical exercise, meditation, and just getting more sleep might be the other effective stress management techniques. As with most of my recommendations, you need to try things for yourself and see what works for you. This next one is actually two habits rolled into one, pun very much intended, and is something around 25% of the global population do. In fact, you might even be doing it as you watch this video. In fact, when rats have been exposed to this habit, scientists looking at their microbiome found decreased levels of bifidobacteria, important for immunity, and inhibiting levels of harmful microbes. They also found lower levels of short-chain fatty acids. These are tiny powerhouses that supercharge your colon, lower inflammation and support overall health. Pretty good. And they also found a lower gut pH. That last one's interesting because a changed pH will inevitably kill off some bacteria you need and encourage others you don't, a condition known as gut dysbiosis. In fact, humans who've given up this habit have been found to have a greater diversity of gut microbes than people who continue this habit. That's important because just like any sports team needs a variety of players, defenders, attackers, strikers, the greater the variety of the gut microbiome, usually the healthier it is. So what's this habit? As if cancer, heart disease, and chronic pulmonary disease weren't enough, you can add poor gut health to the list of smoking's negative consequences. And if you think you're off the hook just because you've switched to vaping, think again. 
For example, the aerosols produced by e-cigarettes result in inflammation and reduced expression of tight junctions, those mortar proteins I mentioned just a minute ago. So if you want to give up smoking, there are a variety of treatments you can try, from patches to drugs to psychological treatments and yes, possibly even vaping on the understanding that it should only be a stepping stone to stopping smoking completely. Just remember, if you give up smoking, you're not just saving your lungs, you're rescuing your gut health too. The next habit secretly wreaking havoc on your gut health is one you might have been told is healthy in moderation. And I know this is going to be controversial alcohol. Now we all know it's not a good idea to regularly get drunk, but what about the oft discussed benefits of moderate drinking? Just one glass of red wine per day. Shockingly, the World Health Organization says that half of alcohol attributable cancels in Europe are caused by light and moderate alcohol consumption. It doesn't matter how much you drink, the risk to drinkers' health starts from the first drop. Yes, red wine contains the antioxidants resveratrol, which is anti-inflammatory, neuroprotective, and supports cardiovascular health. But drinking red wine to get the benefits of resveratrol is a bit like eating a Big Mac for the lettuce. It's the other stuff you need to worry about. I'll tell you five non-alcoholic sources of resveratrol in a minute. But first, what does alcohol do to the gut? Once again, gut dysbiosis raises its ugly head as studies have shown regular alcohol drinkers have reduced levels of beneficial bacteria like Fecalibacterium, Roseburia, and Bacteroides, and an increase in potentially harmful bacteria like Proteobacteria, Streptococcus, and Enterococcus. Unfortunately, alcohol-induced dysbiosis doesn't stop there. It's related to disrupted tight junctions, again, and increased levels of pro-inflammatory molecules. So what are your options if you want to reduce your alcohol consumption? Most alcoholic drinks have an alcohol-free version available these days, so you could try replacing some of the drinks you normally have with 0% alternatives. And if you are going to drink, decide when you will and when you won't and drink sensibly. Finally, you can get all the resveratrol you need from grapes, blueberries, cranberries, and even peanuts and walnuts without ever touching a drop of red wine. Okay, so we've talked about a lot of things that you should stop doing. Let's turn things around and talk about one thing you should do more of and that you could start today. This next habit improves cardiovascular health, protects against depression, and is associated with high cognitive function in older age and can reduce the risk of falls for elderly people. When it comes to the gut, it increases gut bacteria diversity, increases short-chain fatty acid production, those anti-inflammation compounds I mentioned earlier, and promotes gut barrier integrity. If anyone could create a drug that did all of this, they'd be a billionaire. Instead, it's something almost everyone can do, and it's free. And of course, you know by now I'm talking about exercise. Despite all of these benefits, many people still don't get the recommended 150 minutes of moderate physical activity each week. It's something I take much more seriously than I used to, but you don't need to join a gym to benefit your gut microbiome. Benefits will start from just 2,000 extra steps from your baseline. That's just one podcast episode or how far you'll get before you remember where you left your car keys. Do it outdoors and you'll benefit from the sunlight and fresh air as well. Unless you live in the UK where sunlight is more of a myth than a meteorological fact. Why not sign up for a challenge, even if it's one you don't share with anything else? Never mind couch to 5k, what about couch to 1k? Set an alarm to get up from your desk every hour to have a five minute walk. Alternatively, do a free workout on YouTube because there's literally something there for everyone. The good news is that anything you do to increase your physical activity will pay dividends for your gut health. In fact, doing more exercise will naturally help you with the next habit. Now, these last two habits are truly universal. Literally, everyone does them, so it's worth knowing how to do them well. Habit number six is a two-way street with your gut. Bifidobacteria and lactobacillus directly improve our experience of this habit through the production of the neurotransmitters serotonin and GABA. Conversely, a lack of it reduces beneficial bacteria, resulting in, you guessed it, gut dysbiosis. Finally, in a sample of more than 2,500 adults, an incredible 89% admitted their life would be better if they got more of it. No, not that. It's the other thing you need to do in bed as well. You know, less regret and more pajamas. Sleep. You probably know there is no one-size-fits-all approach to sleep. The idea that we all need eight hours of sleep doesn't have any scientific backing and plenty of people will do just fine with more or less than this amount. But with 70% of people from that same survey I just mentioned saying they sleep for seven hours per night or less, and 59% saying they don't sleep enough, most of us could probably use a bit more shut eye. And when you factor in waking up at night for any reason and the time it takes for you to fall asleep, you might realize you don't sleep quite as much as you thought you did. 
Here's University of California scientist Matt Walker. So to get at least the minimum, according to the CDC, of seven hours, you actually have to be on average in bed maybe about eight, eight hours and 15 minutes. So here's a simple way to start improving your sleep hygiene. Track your sleep for a week so you know at least how much you actually get. All you need to do is write down on a notepad the time you go to sleep, the time you wake up, and how you feel. Then, if you do need to sleep more, you could try one of the following. Sleep in a cool, dark room, avoid caffeine after 3 p.m., go to sleep at the same time every night, and stop using electronic devices an hour before bed and do something relaxing instead. And as I just said, you might find that increasing your exercise during the day improves your sleep at night too. And if you're recoiling in the horror at that list thinking, I just possibly couldn't do all of that, I understand. Try doing just one of these things and see what impact that has. I can honestly say improving the quantity and quality quality of your sleep is one of the most powerful ways to improve all aspects of your health, not just gut. Finally, let's talk about the big one. The number one factor that most directly affects all aspects of gut health, diet. As someone who spent the best part of a decade personally studying the gut microbiome, the one change I'd recommend to almost everyone is eat more fiber. But not all fiber is made equal. Soluble fiber found in fruit, beans, and oats is food for the gut microbiome. However, different sources of fiber feed different strains of bacteria, hence a variety of different fibers result in a more diverse and therefore healthier microbiome overall. Insoluble fiber found in most vegetables, and whole grains adds bulk to your stools, turning your meandering meat tunnel into a speedy slipstream. Not glamorous, but deeply functional. Fiber is the dental floss of your gut health. Yet the average American only eats half the recommended 30 grams per day of this gut-friendly super nutrient. Apart from more fiber, most people could probably benefit from simply eating a wider variety of foods in general. Think about a typical meal. How many different foods does it contain? If breakfast for you is just a bowl of cereal, it might be just two, cereal and milk. But by adding some chopped fruit or nuts, it instantly becomes a more diverse meal. You can apply this principle to any meal or snack. Rather than trying to cut things out, just focus on adding in healthy foods and you'll find you naturally eat less of the bad stuff. And like I said earlier, if you'd like to find out which probiotic supplements actually work, you can watch this video now.